Yay, thank you. Okay, Dean, sorry. Uh, yeah. as I was, okay, as I was saying, you know, we've been through this journey of trying to help you learn uh, the, all the different aspects of fly fishing. And uh, so um, we, we started with the basics, we got into some casting, you know, the, the, the basic mm -hmm. cast, with, and it's very difficult, you know, to do it uh, online. Um, and, and Linda and I have been talking about doing it, now that most of us have had, had our shot, doing an outdoor session uh, at the pond that, uh, that, that she and John fish at. And so, you know, if we can do that in the next few weeks, uh, that would be good because we can begin to uh, help you understand, you know, what some of the things are that we're talking about uh, with regard to, uh, you know, the overhead cast or the, you know, the men cast or roll cast or whatever it is. Um, and then uh, we had, you know, we had Eric get into entomology and he talked about the different stages of the insects uh, that the, uh, the trout eat uh, with regard to, uh, you know, nymphing and then the emerging and then, you know, uh, dry flies. And I, and I talked a little bit about terrestrials. So today, what we want to do is begin to discuss how to actually catch trout with the various flies that represent the, um, you know, the, the insects that Eric um, talked about two weeks ago. So now we're talking about the flies and and, and basically how to catch fish. Um, and the first person who's gonna lead it off would be John. Uh, he, he was gracious enough to, to uh, lend his skills with regard to the nymphing. And then I'll talk about emergers and dry flies. Uh, and then Clark is going to uh, uh, discuss the uh, terrestrials. And uh, then Clark and I will finish off with the streamers and poppers. So uh, John, you're first up. And okay, well, thank you guys. We need to give you control of the screen. Um, right. Rick, you wanna, can you do that? It's, it's done, John is co-host. Okay. All right, uh, yeah, so today I'm talking about, about nymphs and I'll just kind of get basically into that right away. The most important thing that comes out about nymphs immediately when you discuss them is that 80 to 90% of what a trout eats is a waterborne insect or what is generally referred to as a nymph. It's kind of an overall term to apply to different stages of life that you've already discussed in, in these meetings about insects that are born in the water and live the majority of their life in the water. <clears throat> the fish are taking them continuously throughout the year. Um, I'm gonna go right into some pictures if I can here. Um, this, this technical part of this whole thing is the, uh, <laughs> it just be a lot easier to do it in person. Let's put it this way. So this is a caddis nymph. Can you see that? Is that visible? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And I, theoretically, I can move this forward. Just a minute. John, I think you need to share. Yeah, I, I did that. Let me get to yeah, the, I saw, I let saw me get the, the right. Let me get to the right screen here. I should be able to advance these forward. I did in my practice session. Anyway, this is, can, you can see the caddis nymph. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And then I have to go back to. Uh, hmm. I, I think you need to just stick on that one. Well, if you know how to do it, I guess. Oh. Yeah, I had these going forward yesterday. Hmm. Mayfly nymph. Looks like it's trying to load. Yeah. Okay, maybe that's a problem. How about clicking up there at open? I don't but, know. But we can see the little pictures. So yeah, we can see them. Yeah. You just say the number. I, that I, we're I, I to just look don't want to have to go backwards on e each one of these to have to uh, to share and stop share and that kind of thing. It's just creating a problem for me. Hmm. Because John, can you not just leave it in that picture? And yeah, we, we can. Picture? We can see all the all the flies. You can and, see all of these. In yeah, this yeah. Page. So you can just point. Why don't you just point to it, and then we can, you know, then you can talk about the difference. Okay. Well, here, here these are just four basic nymphs. There's a variety of different things. People can talk about nymphs and different insect forms for a long time, and it's actually one of the joys of fly fishing is to 
take it deeper and deeper until you really understand the entomology of the river you're on. But for basic nymph fishing, you're talking about caddis nymphs, mayfly nymphs, stonefly, and midge patterns. Those are pretty much the four that you're going to fish with the majority of the time. The typical limitation of a caddis nymph would be, be this little bead head here. Uh, mayfly, boy, there's just so many. This is a pheasant tail. Mm -hmm. I particularly fish with a lot of stoneflies up in the mountains where I live. Uh, and this is my favorite, the Pat's rubber leg. Use it in a variety of different ways. It's a pattern that I use here on the pond. It imitates a lot of different things. It, it collects a lot of water in the chenille body, so it will sink rapidly. And then this last one I brought is kind of a standard for every midge fisherman's uh, fly case, and that's, that's a zebra, zebra uh, midge. A lot of the uh, midge larvae, if you go back to this number four picture, are just sort of a red little, almost a wormy looking thing that are sometimes referred to as annelids. And uh, that, that gives you a basic idea of what you're trying to imitate. Now, the key to your imitations have to do with size, color, and basically silhouette. Um, and then of course your placement as you're trying to get your nymph in, in, front, of, in front of the fish. And uh, let me see if I can move over to this one. Pretty good little picture of how these are. Uh, well, it's just not wanting to load. Okay. This gives you a little bit of an idea the way a lot of people will <clears throat> rig up their nymph rig. Uh, this is actually your anywhere from six to 10 foot leader with the tippet of anywhere from 3X to 6X or even smaller to your dry fly. And then you're going to run that down under your dry fly, another tippet, maybe another anywhere from 18 inches to 30 inches to your nymph. Um, there's a number of ways to get that nymph down below your dry fly. Uh, one is to use a weighted nymph or a bead head nymph. Another is to put a piece of split shot on your line. And I'll show you that in just a second. Um, the dry fly in this case does two different, three different things actually it can actually be taken as a dry fly. And a lot of the guys I fish with on the Arkansas River fish with a big dry fly and one or two nymphs tied below the dry fly. And they will take about 30% of their fish on the dry fly. And uh, often they are the larger fish in that particular fishing situation. That is not always the case. The rest of the fish, the other 70%, uh, usually it's the trailing second dry uh, nymph that they will pick up most of the fish on. Um, let me stop this. Just John, is that trailing, uh, is that trailing, you said the, the second dry fly, is that the one furthest down or is that the one in between? It's going to be the one furthest down. I found percentage wise that it's just amazing how many more uh, are taken on that lowest fly. Mm -hmm. And it tends to be your heavier nymph then? Yeah, no, no I, not it'll, necessarily. It'll actually be just the opposite. It'll be it. What we'll often do is go your heavy nymph first, and you'll put that down where it's the one. Basically, if you get it done right, it's the one bouncing on the bottom. Right. And then if you uh, your your lighter one, your last one is usually actually floating just above the surface. But I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that it's. Uh, it's the smallest one of the, of the two. Well, I John, John, I think you just said, and I want to make sure I understand this. Uh, the second one, after the weighted one, you said is floating just beneath the surface or just <laughs> above, just above? Just, ab the, just above the bottom. Yeah, okay. yeah. Above the bottom would be ideal. I'm sorry, yeah. I'm, in, I'm, I'm just struggling to get in through this particular set of pictures. I don't know how to get. I'll, I'll just go to this for right now and show you um, indicators. Yeah. That's so when you when you rig up assist, oh, brother. I, I went through this two different times yesterday without this problem. <laughs> when you rig up your system, <clears throat> basically off of your line, you're going to run anywhere from let's just say seven to nine feet of leader material down to approximately a three or four x. 
Then you're going to run, you're going to put on an indicator of some kind. This little indicator is called a thingamabob. It's filled with air and gosh, I hate to say it, but you might as well just call it a bobber. And that's a word that fly fishermen just never want to use. <laughs> they, uh, that's don't what like, it is. they don't like that term. <laughs> so instead we use the term indicator. It sounds much more sophisticated. Um, but the, the, it is more than an indicator. It is a suspender. It is suspending your fly in the water column at the appropriate depth to what you're reading the water and to see where the fish are feeding. When you think about nymph fishing, it, it's a, there's two or three things that are so important, it, as much as important as, as I can. It, you, you need to have your fly, your nymph, your bottom flies in front of the fish, preferably within a, a foot of the bottom or even bumping on the bottom. You'll see a lot of videos that say, if you're not snagging the bottom and catching rocks or catching sticks periodically, then you don't have your lowest fly low enough or your heaviest fly low enough. And that's probably true, but it's also very expensive because if you fish heavy water like I do and you're bumping the bottom all the time, you're, use, you're losing flies on submerged rocks and sticks quite often. So I try to stay just a little bit above that. I lose a lot of flies as it is. The second thing that you want to do is you want to make sure that your fly is in the right, we'll call it the right lane. So you're talking about water column from top to bottom of the water and your lane is to where you're fishing, your fish are choosing to lay to feed. So speed and depth are the two key uh, words that you need to know about uh, nymph fishing. Let me see if I can get back into some of my uh, pictures here. Hmm. Now they're all gone. There you go. Oh, there. That's better. Yeah. All right, let's try this. Can you guys see that? No, mm -hmm. you need to share it. We, to yeah, we saw the, yeah, we saw the pictures of the indicators that were a larger picture that time. But, but nothing <laughs> now. So you have to hit your share. You've shared it with yourself, but you have another share button down on the side of your screen. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, right. Yeah. There you go. All right. <laughs> this, this is a picture of uh, <clears throat> an indicator that's made out of yarn. That's a real common indicator. A lot of the guides use this. If you're fishing a lot out of, of, of boats <clears throat> on rivers, famous particularly for the San Juan River, slower rivers, they'll use a big yarn indicator. They'll grease it up and it sits up there and, and they'll tend to use that on water that's a little bit slower. These big fish that you're fishing for in the San Juan and some of these more famous rivers like the Bighorn and the Madison and those kind have, have been caught a lot of times. So when they are feeding, uh, particularly if they're feeding on midge patterns like they do on the San Juan, they're gonna suck that in and spit it right out. And it is such a subtle take that unless you see your indicator move or know what to look for, and I can't imagine how many times I have sat there with a guide on a float trip, particularly on the San Juan, and he said, you just missed a take or set, set, set. And I'm like, what are you talking about? When I'm fishing with a thingamabob or one of the pulsa indicators, that thing's gonna jump about six inches or two inches, or it makes a dip of some kind. Sometimes when you're fishing with a yarn indicator on soft water, it creates just a little concentric ring. So down five feet below that yarn, that fish is just suck in that little midge, that 22 size 22 zebra. And you have to see that concentric ring. Now, when you set your hook, you basically uh, just raise your rod tip. If you have done your line management properly, you're just raising your rod trip tip. Let me uh, get see if I can get out of here again. I, I I wish I could show you this stuff better. I feel feel bad about this that this hasn't worked out. Um, that, John, that showed really well that time. Okay. That's fine. You're not seeing that though. There, this next one. This is a good one that I need you to see. So, let me get back up here. Uh, 
There you go. There's a couple of other rigs with yarn indicators. One will, one will show you a two nymph rig and you can see that what they've done on this one is they have a heavily weighted nymph on the bottom. That looks like a big stonefly. And then about halfway up, they'll put a smaller, uh, smaller fly. So it's a heavy fly that's basically sitting on the bottom. Another way to do that is put your heavy fly on the bottom and tie your lighter fly uh, to the bottom of the heavy fly. And that's often the way I will, I will fish on the Arkansas River is, is with this particular rig. Basic idea is that you want to be, if, if the water's two feet deep that you're fishing, you want your bottom fly tied twice that far below your indicator. In other words, four feet down. I'll often go deeper than that because, again, my home river, the Arkansas, is a very rapid stream and you need a lot of weight and you need to get it down there. One of the reasons I have done a lot of check nymphing in the last two years is because it is a system designed to get the fly to the bottom of the river as fast as it can get there. And it's incredibly effective. And I, I don't want to get into that too much other than to say when you check nymph or Euro nymph, and it's becoming very, very popular. You use a longer rod, you do not use any indicator, bubble or pulsa or yarn. You use what's known as a cider. And a cider is, is simply colored line segments. So you're watching those colored line segments. And I will tell you, that's pretty tricky. You've got to be kind of an advanced fisherman to, to have a lot of success in, in that particular situation. Um, let me just hit check my notes here just a minute. Talked a little a bit about a technique and how to set up your rigs, uh, indicators and uh, the, the next thing I want to talk a little bit about is reading the water. Um, when you dry fly fish, there are all sorts of things that you look for on the surface. And uh, when you nymph fish, you're, one of the things you're primarily focusing on is what I will call a seam. And for want of a better explanation, a seam is the distinction between slower water and faster water, or faster water and a back eddy where the water is being forced backwards. But the ideal nymphing scene, seam is, is, is that, that window, that, that uh, beautiful, if you're a fly fisherman, you just look for those gorgeous seams that might be two inches wide or they might be 20 feet wide. But they're a slightly different speed than the middle of the river and the side of the river. The water at the edge of the seam is pushing over against the bank and slowing down. The water in the middle is very rapid and pushing hard water. The fish are feeding those seams. They're often shown clearly by what we call a foam line or a line of bubbles that have come out of the fast water and they're flowing in a nice clean line downstream. And that's where you wanna put your nymph. So you're gonna cast essentially out of the slow water up and slightly across the seam. And then you're gonna raise your rod tip a little bit to pull as much line as you possibly can <laughs> off of that water because you wanna make sure that your nymph is moving at the same speed as a natural nymph would be moving. Understanding the hydraulics of the river is as important to really high success levels of fly fishing as uh, pretty much anything I know, especially when you're trying to fish six feet down under water where you're counting on your indicator up here, giving you a clue of what's going on six feet below the surface because you can't see what's going on down there. If you're fishing in 18 inches of water, you might see a fish flash. You might, in the San Juan, they often say, just watch for that fish's lip. You see a, a white flash where they open their mouth. That's not gonna happen in rapid water very often. So what you're looking for is that indicator to just take a little bit of a jump. In which case, if you're managing your line properly and you have your rod tip up, you're just gonna raise that rod tip and you're on, on the fish. Let me see if I can go back to a, a couple pictures. I like this picture really well, if I can get it up. Can you see that one? Mm -hmm. I see them all. Okay, this is a good, this is, this is a picture of a lady fishing. She's got her rod tip up and you can see the indicator there on the water. And it's actually following the foam line downstream right across from her. Um, some of the videos that you watch on, on nymph fishing will, will suggest that you really shouldn't let your indicator go a lot too much below you or you shouldn't fish downstream. And, and that's pretty much true. But <clears throat> there is a point when you're fishing with nymphs where when it's above you, you can actually raise that rod tip up. It's called the, 
the old days, the Lysenring lift. And it's responding and creating a nymph indication that's swimming up to the surface in order to hatch as an adult. That's another piece of tech, tech we won't get into today. But the other place that it works effectively is, it's, is as you let that come well below you and you begin to swing it in towards you or toward the bank, and then you lift again, it's a very effective way uh, to catch fish at that point. Um, just kind of cover a couple of more technique things here, if I try to get back to one more of my screens, one more eye pictures. Yep. <laughs> I don't know how I got that one. Are, are you seeing that? No. Oh, okay. Well. Share screen? Yeah. Uh, Well, I wish I was doing this in person. <laughs> uh, unfortunately. <laughs> there you go. Now, you seeing that guy, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, John, if you click on that, uh, that uh, little thing down in your bottom right-hand corner, does that of your screen that I can see? Uh oh, now I'm in trouble. I can't get out of this. It's, it's on the screen that we're looking at. Uh, it's down at the bottom right hand side, at the, but I don't no, think, I, I, I think you're looking at a, at a single screen and we're looking at a multiple screen. A multi, yeah. uh, all of your flies we're looking at. All the photos. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I, I have done something here and I can't even see you guys now. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Gosh. Yeah, you. <laughs> All right. Well, let me finish what I'm trying to say, and then I will pass this on. You guys move on to the next one. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let me just say a couple things about just kind of sum this up with technique. If you're, are you seeing me? Yeah. You're, that's funny. I can't see you. All I can see is the picture that I have in front of me, a picture of a guy nymph fishing. So, all right. Some are, some, we'll summarize with this. First of all, you're going to try to imitate whatever is 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 working in that stream, and you, hopefully you have someone that'll tell you, you know, these are the nymphs we want to be fishing with. This is the good imitation. We're going to use this particular beadhead. We're going to tie on one or two, and then we're going to uh, rig up with our indicator. Then when you cast, you're going to cast essentially up and across, and you're going to, by doing a number of different things, you're going to try to keep that nymph in the feeding zone as long as possible. One is to raise the rod tip so that you're not dragging a lot of excess line that's pulling your fly unnaturally downstream. The other, of course, is to mend your line upstream if your indicator's going too fast downstream. That is a very important part of the uh, of what we're trying to get done here, is you, you need to mend, and we will talk more about that at another time. Um, secondly, oh, you want to follow your indicator basically with your rod tip. You don't necessarily point it right at the indicator, but your rod tip needs to be kind of in line with that paralleling along. Um, and uh, that way you can adjust your speed and your depth. Um, and so when you see an, your indicator jump, you can raise your rod tip and, and you're on the fish. Um, I, I don't have I don't have a lot more I can can tell you at this point on that I think that's probably used up my time in any case apologize for the technical stuff but I assumed that was probably going to happen. Oh, that was good. I think I'll pass, I'll pass that on to the next presenter unless you guys have questions that you want to want to ask. It I, I've got I've got at least two questions. My first one would be, uh, why would you not use just a, a dry fly? as your indicator all the time and increase your odds. I mean, why would you use an indicator? And I know you do, and I know there's some reasons for it, but I don't, you know, I'd always use a hopper or something as a dry fly. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you two or three reasons. Uh, one, one of the ones is that 
a lot of the times they don't float nearly as well. And so if you're heavy fishing, heavy seams, like uh -huh. real heavy water, I last summer when I was up in Wyoming, right. I was fishing just the fish, the cutthroats and the whitefish, both were in very heavy white water. And uh, I don't know why, but they wanted oxygenated water that day. I wouldn't have been able to float that hopper more than about uh, 10 inches. It would have been down even if I had greased it. Properly. Right. I understand. So that would, that would be one reason. The other, the other reason is that um, if you catch, which is great to catch a fish on a hopper, but let's say you're basically trying to get down deep to some fish that you know are deeper. And if you're catching a six inch brown on your hopper, which is not uncommon, you might as well just plan on retying those two flies at the bottom behind you. <laughs> because when he comes in and he's spinning and jumping and flopping, yeah, uh, uh, got it. your rig is going to be a disaster. That, so that would be the, the two reasons. But my son only fishes with the dry fly on top. And I have a lot of friends who just can't see any point of using a bobber when they can use a dry fly and maybe catch an extra fish. Yeah. Okay. I think the dry fly is great if, it's, if you're in uh, water that's not, not as... Uh, uh, heavy. I mean, when it's a slower current, and I also think when it's not as deep. I mean, I think when you can see the fish, you can sight. You know, you can sight them, and you've got a dry fly on, and you know that doesn't spook them. But, uh, but I, th I agree with John. I think if you're in heavy water, you the, the dry fly is not gonna. <laughs> it's not gonna work. <laughs> I'm, I'm obviously not much of a nympher, so that's yeah. that's the question. But my second question was when you're talking about the check fishing, which I'm at least aware of basically what it is in the sight line. So do you need a, 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 a sight line of, for every weight rod you have that you're nymphing with? Uh, I keep a separate rod just, just for check nymphing. Ah, and, right. and it is rigged with a, a flatter line and a long leader. You're gonna start out with about a 12 foot, pretty flat leader. It's a different type of leader. It's a milky color itself. So you can actually kind of see oh. it differently on the water. Uh -huh. And then the last six feet of it are sort of a striated color stripes. And uh, then it, it, it's used, that whole technique is used in, in competitive fishing. When the yep. US team fishes against the teams from Europe and Russia, et cetera, they're not allowed to put any kind of weight or indicator on their lines. All, all the knots have to be tied off in the, all the fish have to be tied off separate, or the, the nymphs have to be tied off separately. Um, so they use a very, very heavy fly on the bottom, often use a mop fly or something that really takes a lot of weight. And they're almost all tied in a jig manner so that the hook rests theoretically up. Mm -hmm. and doesn't catch quite as much it's it's intriguing uh but man it's a it's a lot of work and you're only casting you're really not casting more than about 30 feet it's a lot of there you're using a lot of your rod tip you, your rod itself is like a three weight rod or five weight rod at the base and a three weight rod at the tip so it's very mm -hmm. very it has a lot of wiggle in the tip mm -hmm. and you're trying to feel and, you know, honestly, I, I, I would like to be personally at a place where I just don't put an indicator on, where I'm so in touch with what that nymph is doing in the, in the river, and I can feel it. And I have managed my line so well that I can actually feel every hit, and I don't have to depend on the indicator. And that's what the check nymphing is basically teaching me. Okay. Thanks for that, John. Yeah, I would say most of us are going to be using indicators. Uh, there's a guy that I know, he's, a, he's an expert fly fisherman, and he doesn't put anything on. He just, he nymphs with, uh, you know, with, with no indicator, no dry flying, but, but he's really, really good. And, and, uh, and I asked him, I said, Charlie, how do you do that? He said, well, if there's any hesitation at all, he said, I lift. And maybe there's nothing there, but I lift anyway, because there might be a fish there. And he said, you know, half the time I actually hook a fish and, uh, you know, the other time there's nothing there. I hit a piece of rock or something and he doesn't care, you know. So, you know, to, to be able to do that, uh, I think you have to fish a lot. <laughs> you have to be pretty good to be able to do that. And it's not something that, uh, you know, that, that I ever got the hang of because it, it's really hard. You know, no, to and in, in some ways, just basic min fishing, if you fish a, a thingamabob indicator yeah. and at 30 inches of, of a, say, a bead head hair's ear below that, it's one of the most effective and easiest ways you can fish. 
you know, all you really have to do is learn how to cast it into a zone where a fish is going to be because, and you can really catch a lot of fish that way because you can see what's happening. You'll see that orange indicator move. So you can go from being one of the, one of the most basic beginner levels all the way to what your friend's doing. I think the other thing too uh, is that when you're nymphing is that it, it is, uh, I found it when I first started uh, fishing a little easier to make my cast because it was a little heavier um, weight at the end. So it would, it would make it a little bit easier to cast. The only problem is that you begin to, to get a little better and you put two flies on and all that and you got a, you know, a split shot or something like that, you can get a lot of tangles too. So even oh, though- Oh, you can, it's, yes. It's, in some ways it may seem easier, but in, in others, you just have to be careful about what you're doing. No, no doubt about it. I think the, easy, the easiest way to fish and rig is just one single dry fly. Yeah. But it's yeah. not always the most effective way to actually catch yeah. it. Well, I mean, obviously you have to have something going on, but uh, anyway, thank you, John. Um, so I'm gonna start talking about emergers, cripples and dry flies. I mean, I put them all in kind of one class. I separated them on the outline, but uh, I, I kind of fish all of those flies the, the same way. So uh, Rick, can I? You are co-host. Okay, so um, I hope you have your outline because what I'm gonna do is get, kind of talk about all these things and I'm gonna show my, my screen and I'm, I'll show you some of the things that, uh, uh, some of the flies you know, that, that, that I actually use. Uh, as far as the gear is concerned, um, you know, if you're on the Henry's Fork or the Missouri or the, or the Big Orton, you know, the places where there's uh, a lot of dry fly go, uh, hatches going on, um, I'll tell you on, on Henry's Fork, typically the guys that I fish with, they're using leaders and tippers that are 12 to 16 feet long, um, down to 6X, and, and you know, they're catching 20 inch fish with that, with that rig. And uh, um, so it's not easy. When you, when, you, when you make a cast with a much longer um, leader and tippet, um, you can get tangled, you can get, you know, wind knots, all kinds of things can happen. So you have to work at it in order to get uh, good enough to make that cast without, without having a problem, of, you know, laying it out uh, properly. Um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> I think that's one of the things that you have to uh, be aware of. The, the trout behavior, when you start with the mergers and cripples, it tends, the trout tend to be a little aggressive. And the first thing you're gonna have, are you're gonna have the smaller fish and they're very aggressive. And you're gonna have a lot of action, the, the hatch is starting. And remember when Eric was talking about the nymphing and then the, 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 the uh, uh, insects uh, beginning to uh, become adults, you know, they begin to emerge out of the water column. And, uh, you know, the trout obviously see that. And so the small fish start getting very excited and, uh, uh, normally I usually wait because eventually you'll start having bigger fish come up and what happens with the bigger fish is you'll see you'll start to see, they're not taking the 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 fly off the surface they're taking it just below the surface so basically what happens is they'll take the fly that's cut uh, that's coming up out of the surf uh, out of the column and then they'll, they'll go like this and you'll see their tail uh, and and you see that and you begin to realize okay and when you see the tail and the tail is, is pretty big, you know that's a big fish. So uh, typically uh, I, I will wait until I, I start seeing that kind of uh, behavior. And uh, I wanna show you, I don't. Fine, when you're done, you no, that. Uh, that's not the one I uh, wanted. <laughs> I already could leave it out, but I don't think you should because they no, messed up. So Tom said friends that they had their bikes stolen. I'm not sure if I'm being. All right, so you're not muted, Eric. Are they your pardon? You were. Can you hear there. me? <clears throat> I'm not sure what happened there. I uh, I guess I'm. It's not working, so I'm going to have to close this out. John feels better now. <laughs> yeah, I don't feel so dumb, although, well, I actually do, but. No, I don't. you shouldn't. <laughs> okay. 
I thought I could do it this way, but I'm not going to work that way. So I'm going to have to go back to this. All right. So uh, here is the emerger. Takes a little longer to open up. And essentially, this is a fly that, that I will uh, use. And I'll usually trail it off of a dry fly. In other words, I might have, you know, 12 to 14 feet of leader and tippet and I'll have a dry fly and then I'll drop off an emerger. And basically what I want is I want that emerger to be in the film. I, I don't really want that, that fly to look like a, a dry fly. I want it to be in the film because that's really where the, you know, the fish are taking it. So that's, that's a, an emerger. And um, essentially uh, it's in a very effective, this is CDC. This is a, a type of uh, uh, tying material that comes off of a duck and it's the rear end of a duck and it essentially uh, provides a little bit of buoyancy. So basically it, it, it doesn't sink, it just stays in the, certain, in the film. All right, let me go to the next one. Get rid of this one if I don't figure out how to do that. Okay, so so this particular fly is called a last chance cripple. And again, you have the CDC here. And what happens is that you see this is called the trailing shuck. And what 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 you're seeing is a fly that was designed by a guy named Rene Harrop at uh, Henry's Fork. Uh, he's probably one of the more famous uh, fishermen in that area. And um, what this particular fly does is it, it, uh, it does sit on the surface. So this guy kind of sticks up like a dry fly, but then you have this trailing shuck that is actually, um, usually what I do is I wet it with my saliva and it'll sink just below the surface. So when you think about the behavior of trout, basically the trout are opportunistic. And uh, essentially what they do is, uh, you know, they look for situations where they can eat without having to struggle. And if it's a, a fly that's coming out of the surface and takes off, basically, uh, they're, not gonna get a, they're not gonna get a meal. So the, 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 the cripple uh, is one that is, uh, um, a fit, you know, the fish will look at it and say, okay, well, this, this fish, this, this particular fly is stuck in the in the in the surface, and uh, and they'll take this particular fly uh, quite often. Uh, and I will show you this particular fish. This is a 25-inch uh, rainbow uh, hen, what we call a female. And I caught this fish with a size 18 cripple, last chance cripple, which is the one I just showed you. So it it can be a very effective fly. Uh, large fish um, on the Missouri do rise and uh, typically you know they're looking for uh, they're looking for an easy meal. And this particular channel is a slow channel and they you know they, they sit in here and eat all day. So basically uh, you know as we're looking at Uh, how to uh, actually uh, catch these fish. Uh, as I said, you know, the, the cripple, I fish like a dry. Uh, the emerger, I typically will trail that off of a dry fly so that I can have the, uh, the fly uh, trailing uh, in the film. Uh, and I think that, um, I don't know. I mean, I catch a lot of fish with cripples, probably more than with emergers. So, uh, I think the cripple is a very effective uh, fly uh, that you can catch fish anywhere if they're rising. Now going to the dry fly. Um, hey, the, Dean? Yeah. Dean, I got a question. Um, yep. don't mind. Um, why not fish a cripple by itself? Um, or you... I do. Oh. I do. I, I, I meant to say I, I, I usually trail the merger off of a dry fly. The cripple, I just fish okay. by itself. All right. I, I, I should have. No, maybe I misunderstood. Thank you. No, no, no. That that was my fault. Uh, and basically, um, the merger, I personally find the mergers harder to fish. I, mean, I have a harder time catching fish with emergers. I know on the on uh, the Missouri uh, at the end of the day, and this is when it's like 
you can hardly see, uh, the, uh, you, you'll, you'll start getting a caddis hatch and you'll see fish tailing and, in, and they're, they're going crazy because the caddis is a little bigger fly. You know, maybe a 12 or 14 versus a size 18 or 20, you know, for a mayfly. And uh, I've been there and uh, I, I tell you, I mean, I, I'll have a, 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 a caddis emerger on there and it's really difficult to catch those fish. Uh, now many of them have been caught many times and so therefore they're, they're harder to catch anyway, but it is difficult to catch those fish. Um, and then going to the dry fly, uh, the same thing, I, I think the gear is long, you know, long leaders, et cetera. Now we're talking about the adults, which are done or the spinners. And I'll show you, um, this is a pale morning done. that I use, this is a spinner and parachute spinner. So all of these are types of flies that uh, imitate dry flies that I use. Uh, I, I probably, again, will catch more, more uh, fish with the spinner, um, especially on Henry's Fork or, or on the Missouri. Uh, I, like, I like the CDC spinner. I think uh, it's very effective. Um, when I was showing a picture of the uh, trichle hatch uh, earlier in our lessons with, with Karen, uh, essentially, uh, this is the fly. This is not the particular fly, but the, but, uh, the actual uh, trichle was actually uh, smaller than this. And uh, I will show you, um, well, no, I can't find it. So anyway. One of the things I, I think uh, uh, you, you find out with large fish is that the, instead of splashy risers, the risers are very soft. Sometimes you just see a dimple. If it's a dry fly, you just see a dimple and that, you know, and that fish is taking a dry fly. The other thing is that um, there's kind of a rhythm um, that, that goes on. And I think that becomes very, very important because when you think about the tactics of catching fish, um, when you're doing the upstream cast, essentially what happens is you're, you're actually gonna have your line go over the fish. And, um, and, and the thing about big fish is that they've been caught a lot of times and so it's more difficult to catch them. Um, and one of the things that I, um, I learned from a, a pretty good fly fisherman is that he, he said, you know, when the fish is rising and takes, takes a fly off the surface, uh, he will wait until that that fly is taken, and then he, then he'll make the cast. Because when the fish goes down, he doesn't see your fly. I mean, he doesn't see your line. And so, if you're making an upstream cast, uh, that can be valuable because you didn't see. You know, they won't see your tippet, and um, you know they come up and they see the look up, and then they see another fly, and they might just take it. And I think that is fairly effective. Um, one of the one of the things that we find uh, when we're on the Henry's Fork is that just about everybody there, including the very best fishermen are doing downstream casts. They're doing downstream casts and they're doing angle casts so that the only thing the fish sees or the first thing the fish sees is a fly. They don't see your tippet, they don't see your line, all they see is a fly. And uh, the, the, the problem with that is that the downstream cast is not an easy, easy cast to learn because you have to keep the fly going downstream at the same uh, rate as the current. And so you're actually flipping out line, you know, with your rod. Um, and um, as soon as, as soon as, you know, you don't keep up with it and there's drag, you know, you, the fish will never take that fly. Um, there's a, there's a guy that uh, actually helped him catch a fly, a uh, fish one time. <laughs> Uh, he's a very famous guy by the name of Eddie Pinkston, and uh, he, he died uh, about six or seven years ago. But um, pretty well-known guy. Um, he was on TV a lot. And um, he, he, could, he could flip that thing out for 30, 40 feet. <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, it just, uh, I was watching fish one time on the Henry's work, and, um, you know, he, he would just make these uh, long downstream casts at the, uh, and hook the fish maybe 40 feet, 50 feet, you know, below them. Uh, but anyway, that's something that, that if you're going to 
do this, you have to practice. And you have to practice on, on moving water. Um, the angled cast, I don't think it's quite as hard. I mean, it's basically you're at the, on the side of the fish and uh, you're making a cast to the fish uh, that may be slightly uh, upstream. And uh, again, you're trying to get the fly over the fish without the, the fish seeing your, uh, your, your leader or tippet. Um, and, you know, these, these fish become very wary because, uh, as I said, you know, by the time they get to be 16, 17 inches, they've been caught a lot. And um, so they're going to be, uh, um, they're going to be a lot tougher to catch. Uh, let's see. That, that I've covered just about everything that I wanted to cover. Um, and I think um, at this point, we're going to move to Clark. Right, Clark, are you about ready to talk about terrestrials? I'll do the best I can. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, Clark, you are a co-host. Oh, my. Thank you. <laughs> Don't let it go to your head. Let's hope, let's hope I can do this. <laughs> good presentation there, uh, John and Dean. Those are both good, uh, good stuff. Um, terrestrials are really, honestly, one of my favorite ways to fish. And um, it certainly doesn't happen all the time. You can't just go out and assume a fish is going to take a terrestrial, but why, uh, when the fish are on and terrestrials are available, it's a really fun, exciting, and um, not too awful technical, um, in my opinion. So let's make sure we know what terrestrials are. Um, I call them, they're, they're bugs that don't really belong in the water. They belong on land and they fall in the water and they provide an easy meal for trout. Um, now, when do these things, and what are they? They're, well, they're crickets, ants, grasshoppers, um, bees, like wasps even. I don't think I've ever caught a trout on a wasp pattern, but I've got a couple of wasp patterns. <laughs> but um, grasshoppers, beetles, ants uh, are, are a good mainstay late in the summer or early fall generally. So let's talk. I, I do want to touch on a little something that's uh, close to my heart, and that's catch and release tactics. Uh, late in the summer, when you might be fishing for terrestrials or September maybe, water is generally warmer. Sometimes water is down. And fish maybe have been caught a time or two, but they're getting a little tired and the water's warm and they're not as frisky sometimes. So what that leads to is more stressful fish when you catch them. And we've all seen videos on YouTube and things of people mishandling fish. Uh, so that, you know, they think they're releasing them and they may, may not live to see another day. So my, my point here only has nothing to do with terrestrials, has to do with just ethics of fishing and hopefully catch that fish next year is to keep the fish in the water as much as you can, keep water going through his gills, make sure if you're handling the fish, your hands are wet, you got to take a picture, which I generally do, you know, get them up and in the water quickly. Make sure you release them in the right way. If you're with a guide, you'll know how to do that. But in general, you need to make sure the fish is ready to go out of your hands um, before you let them go. He should swim away when he's ready. So, um, if anybody else has anything to add to that, I just wanted to throw that out there because um, yeah, Clark, that is something very near and dear to my heart, too, because I see evidence of abuse around the Saddlebrook Lakes, and it's not any of us. Uh, rather, it's uh, kids that come from Catalina or whatever, and, and it pains. Well, there is one fisherman, spin fisherman, who uses a rag he carries in his back pocket to hold the fish, and of course, that's wiping all the mucus off. Sure. But the one thing that I learned of late that beginning fisher fishermen may not know is 
uh, when you're trying to revive the fish, don't pull it back and forth because you actually can drown the fish when you pull it backwards. Um, rather, you just, if you need to help the fish get some air, you kind of bring it forward, but don't be dragging it back again. Um, good points. I, uh, um, the hardest fish I had to revive, and this is a true story, it just happened last year when Linda said I went to Christmas Island, it was my bucket list. And I'd never done any fishing like that ever before. And I was fortunate enough to catch a big uh, GT, a giant trevally. Well, this giant trevally took this big fly and he put it down right, I, I guess right in here. You know, where you've got gills on the, outside and then between the gills you've got what do you call them john or dean uh, just that area which is down the gut but not all the way down mm -hmm. so the point is this guy was bleeding and i it took me you know 25 minutes to get this fish in on a 12 weight and i get him in and there's blood in the water and it took a couple of pictures but it honestly took 20 minutes to get him going so he could swim away because he'd lost a fair amount of blood. It was a long fight. And, um, mm -hmm. and but he, he swam away finally. But it was, it, it, there were times where I figured he wasn't even going to live. And this, yeah, yeah just, I would have felt terrible, seriously. So anyway, uh, let's go on to anybody else. Let's go on to terrestrials. <laughs> <laughs> um, fish are opportunistic, of course, as I think Dean and John both said. Um, it, it, if you've got a running stream, let's say a river, and you've got a, a trees overhead or grass on the banks, and the wind is blowing a little bit, you're going to have some insects fall into that river near the edges. Um, and when they fall in the river, it doesn't take long generally for a trout to, uh, to scarf one of those up. When you're casting with a terrestrial, um, and I got some pictures coming here, but um, when you're casting a terrestrial, you don't, the, the, to me, the presentation isn't all that critical because you really, what you wanna do is create a little bit of a splat. If you've got a grasshopper pattern on your line and you throw it towards the bank, you want it to splat well, just like a grasshopper would if he was being blown into the water. That attracts the fish just because of the action on the water. And that fish is going to try to get that hopper or beetle or ant before that, that terrestrial can get away or before another fish gets it. So therefore, from that standpoint, it's not really a easy light presentation you need like you would with a mayfly or something. Um, let's go to some, let's see if I can do this. Let's go to some pictures. Uh oh. <laughs> okay, you have to have the document open on your desktop and then screen. There you go. Perfect. You got that one? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, Dean was talking about um, this is a picture of a picture, actually. Um, Dean, I think, was talking about catching uh, big fish on small flies and um, this certainly happens. Uh, John mentioned it up about Navajo Dam up at uh, uh, San Juan. Very small bugs, smaller than this actually, um, and big fish. So you really can catch big fish, and I love to do it on, uh, on a small fly. Um, here's a small fly box of some terrestrials. Grasshoppers over here on the right, um cicadas might be uh in here it might be a cicada uh, other hoppers all kinds of things these are mostly foam bodied um large hooks here's a dime and what makes it easy for a beginning fisherman especially is you can see the darn things you throw it out there my gosh you can see the fly for a change um as we get older and the, yeah, geez, prescription sunglasses, whatever, it's still very hard to see a size 20 mayfly sitting on a surface 20 feet away. 
these make it easier. As we might all know, uh, some of these things on top, like a parachute, is there basically in these orange foam, are there for visibility. So the fisherman can actually see the fly. The fly is sitting up on top of the water, generally. Um, usually you goop it up with some uh, gink. I don't know, maybe you can't see that because you can't see me, right? Yeah, yeah, you, did. Yeah. Yeah. you did see it? Yes. Or some top ride. Mm -hmm. um, to keep the fly on the water um, on top. Here's another uh, picture of another box. Uh, similar, you got some stone flies in here and you've got uh, ants over here. Um, I just love throwing these things because you can see them and the act action on the surface of the water is incredible. This is just for uh, comparison. Uh, talk about those big bugs. These are like 20s and 22s, nymphs, of course, and you know, it's very small. Um, but that's what catches big fish sometimes, but a whole different way of fishing, of course. Well, especially on the San Juan. Yeah, <laughs> it, that's what it's known those, for. Those little, those little midges, I mean, it's amazing, uh, you yeah. know, that yeah. they take that. Yeah, and I think that's probably where I got those bugs uh, yeah. from yeah. the fly shop up there. Here's some, uh, I just threw this in here just in case somebody wanted to see it. Uh, some uh, some other nymphs, uh, bead head patterns mostly, um, just for size comparisons. Uh, here's an ant. Now let's talk a little bit about ants. Sometimes you can throw hoppers and uh, other big bugs and nothing is happening. Uh, you can't get a rise or anything out of a fish. And, um, and an ant frequently, more often than I would like to even consider, I think I've bypassed fishing ants way too many times. Um, they'll float on the surface and uh, they'll get slurped up. Um, fish like them, they're more in, more in the water than you think, especially over near shore, um, shore, uh, near the bank. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, what else was I going to, I was going to say, uh, let's talk about a little bit more about equipment. Um, generally you need a, a shorter leader, a heavier leader, maybe three X, um, six or eight pound that equates to three X or two X tip it 10 pound is a, I think two X, something like that. Um, but I don't think you'd want to put a, a, a two X tippet with an ant because it's going to overweight the ant. Um, so you have to have it appropriate for the size of the bug you're chucking. Um, I, I think I use uh, just just the same kind of gear that I would for a dry fly when I'm using an ant, a small ant that's a size 18. Yeah. Um, so you, you know, it's just basically fly, uh, using a dry fly. Although there are, there are people that will actually drown the ant. Yeah. Uh, and um, and find that that's very effective, just like a nymph. But but I know that. Uh, uh, I know in the Spring Creeks in Livingston, uh, those fish like ants. I mean, they they will actually when there's nothing else happening when the you know in the afternoon when the when the hatch is over and basically you're they're not you're not seeing any other mayflies, uh, the ants can be very effective. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> um, just like other kinds of fishing, you can uh, have a hopper dropper. Um, John mentioned, uh, of course, uh, putting a, a large floating fly like a hopper. Uh, I love fishing that way too. Uh, I'd rather watch a hopper than a bobber. And um, uh, the, the, the key is to keep the, the hopper or the, the big fly uh, from sinking and being weighted down by uh, any significant weight on the lower fly. And again, you're talking 18, 24, 36 inches, something like that, depending on the conditions of the, the, the tippet material between the, the tail of the hopper and the hook of the uh, dropper, depending right. on, and you can fish two floaters too. Uh, you can fish a hopper and then put an ant on and have them both floating. Um, the problem with that is you have potential visibility of the leader 
uh, between the two. And it, yeah. and some people also say that if you tie to the to the hook, to, to uh, see if you tie, let's say this is a hopper, and you tie tie to this with another short piece of leader or some length of leader or tippet material. Um, sometimes it impedes the the ability of this bug to catch the fish mm. uh, because the line itself might get in the way of a good hook set. Speaking of hook sets, anything on a surface like a hopper, terrestrial, requires you to have a lot of patience. Um, you get so excited when you see a fish come up and smash a, a grasshopper pattern and the temptation is to swing on it and generally you pull a pull the hook right out of the fish's mouth. You've got to wait until that fish actually gets that hopper in his mouth and heads down into the water again, and then slowly rise up to, to catch, to, to hook the fish. So hook set is incredibly, um, you have to be really um, uh, patient, if you will, about that entirely different than if you see a wiggle on a indicator you see a wiggle on an indicator you just, you move right on it but on a, a dry fly especially a bigger dry fly you got to have your patience um again a lot of times um it's a short overhead cast generally the only the only thing that you really have to be not the only thing but a big thing you have to be concerned about is if you're casting towards the bank. Um, generally, you can easily overshoot it by a foot and get snagged in the in the brush or in a tree. Um, we've all lost flies that way. Um, you're lucky if you've got grass on the edge of the um, on the edge of the water. You can actually overcast by a foot or two and then just kind of pull tight and get the. the the hopper, if you will, to, or ant or beetle to plop into the water right next to the bank, which is an excellent place for fish to hide. Um, mm -hmm. under, undercut banks are wonderful, wonderful hiding places for big fish. And if you can get close to that undercut bank, and if the fish is in there, you could have a, a fantastic uh, take on a, on a topwater terrestrial. Yeah. Um, maybe that's about it. I don't know. I, I might have another couple of pictures here. I, I know I think I do. Here's a grasshopper, typical pattern, uh, high visibility, uh, floating at, uh, uh, foam on the bottom, most likely on this guy. Here are three other big bugs. Um, and I, I took this picture because here's what we see from the top and here's what the fish sees from the bottom. So keep in mind, you know, they're looking up and, and what was a, there's red on the bottom of this uh, big uh, uh, stimulating bug here, uh, but on, t on top, you don't see that, but the fish certainly does. And of course, uh, if you got a full fly box, you've got to have one of every color and every size. Um, and this is a very, very common, I use this a fair amount. I don't know what you call this. It's got some flash on it. This is the bottom side of it, of course, but um, this flash uh, can be very attractive uh, to a fish underwater. Oh, I'm gonna say one other thing. Um, it's hard sometimes to get fish to look up. Sometimes, most of the time, as John said, you know, 80 or 90% of the uh, the food taken by a trout is subsurface. And that's because the food is very plentiful down there. And so, it's so frustrating if you want to be topwater fly fishing and with or without terrestrials, and the fish are not really looking up because there's not much happening up there. All the food is down. So therefore, with a hopper or terrestrial activity, if you can slap that thing on the water, even though the fish is looking down, if he's close by, um, he'll take notice. He'll look up and see what was that, and he'll probably respond really rapidly and not have to look that fly over carefully. Um, it's an ambush kind of a thing. So um, I guess that's about all I've got. Um, I'll, I'll make one other comment. Uh, sure. I, I, 
I often will twitch it. Oh, okay, yeah. I, I, meant to I will often twitch it because uh, terrestrials basically are, mo are are basically struggling and you know, trying to get out of the water. So sometimes when you twitch it, you know, and the, and the fish actually begins to respond to that because they realize that, that that hopper is trying to get away and, uh, you know, they'll strike that. But anyway, Clark, that was great. Uh, our Clark, last section is streamers. So we got a, oh, we got. Uh, I was going to ask Clark a question about stimulators. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to say anything about, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's basically a trust roll that floats That's up there. Is. Maybe it's a dry fly, <laughs> but it, it doesn't imitate anything. But it, uh, there's uh, Linda's got something going on there. Yeah, yeah. Linda's got some. Okay. I just tied all these stimulators. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, let's see that. Oh, nice. <laughs> They're not the easiest. No. It's, I, I guess a stimulator, uh, correct me uh, if, if I'm wrong, Dean, you, you, you know, um, I think a stimulator is something that doesn't necessarily mimic a natural existing bug. Yeah, I don't think it, uh, it's supposed to look like any specific, but it looks like a bug. And I think that uh, quite often, especially on ponds and lakes, I mean, they're very effective. We see a lot of them for yeah. uh, salmon flies and uh, yeah. and uh, on the Northwest rivers, a lot of stuff. I have a question. Yep. How, how trusting are you when you are off to some place that you're not overly familiar with and you go into the fly shop and they recommend here are the things you should have. And then when I have done that, not often, but I'll get to the river and the guy says, what in the world are you doing? <laughs> I, 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 I have not had that experience, but um, I really do. Those guys? Well, I think you can run into that, you know, anywhere. But I, I think generally speaking, if it's a good fly shop, they're not, they're, you know, they're going to try to uh, recommend things that, uh, you know, that are working on that particular uh, river or, se or the sections where they fish. So I, I, I don't think they're going to, just want to sell you a bunch of stuff that doesn't work. Uh, I got to tell a story you know. if you don't mind. Yeah. You guys have been up to San Juan and you know the famous Abe's fly shop. Yeah, yeah. Well, Abe, Abe passed away last year, mm -hmm. but I was able to go into his shop many times when he was there in the shop. Very enthusiastic guy, nice, nicest guy in the world. But a lot of the times when we walk into fly shops, I find out we want to tell the guy at the fly shop how much we know and we end up basically talking about the flies that we use back home and blah, blah, blah. And Abe learned long ago that whatever anybody says he'd agreed with. And his famous line was, that'll work, that'll work, that'll work. And we ended up buying all this pretty much the same stuff we had at home and didn't work at all. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that's an example of a, of a fly shop that, um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know if I'd uh, go back, you know. Um, a couple of uh, times, that I, was my, I, experience, my experience once in Montana. Yeah. And that I, can, was... I can see that happening. When I, I did not trust fly shops for the first 20 years that I fished. And eventually, I came to realize that if you walked in there and you spent, it used to be a minimum $50, which pretty much is only going to get you about 10, 12 flies nowadays that you were going to get good information. And fortunately we have, I think we have a new breed of fly shop owners and managers now that do give much better, more accurate information, even if they don't think you're a big spender, or if you have signed up to do a float trip with them. If you've signed up to do a float trip, you're going to get hundred percent of the good stuff. So it is a little bit tricky and I understand. Yeah. I think if they know that you know what you're talking about, they, you know, they, they want to give you the best information they can. I know. I know it at the Trout Hunter at Henry's Fork. We go, we go in there. We've been fishing so long, and we know everybody there. And, um, and they, and they, and they will tell us what's happening. Um, but they also know that we know how to catch fish. So, so they're gonna, they're gonna basically tell us what's going on. And, uh, and, and, and basically, we have all the flies. You know, I mean, I, I was telling some of them, uh, John. You know, I have a, a buddy of mine who's in Fly Tire Magazine all the time, and. Um, and he can tie, you know, the last chance cripple. He can tie the no hackle done. I mean, he could tie any of those flies that are so hard to tie. 
Um, and, and so basically uh, I pay him the two bucks to fly instead of four bucks to fly <laughs> and, uh, yes. and he'll tie up anything that I want. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, uh, um, it, it, I think it's very true that when you go somewhere, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of gauging whether or not, you know, you know, you, you know that you know what you're talking about basically I would would yeah, you because there's a lot of people that take advantage of the fly yeah, shops too yeah. and so it's a two-way street well yeah. anywhere that i go if it's somewhere i've never been i i usually will hire a guy because i want to i want to find out what's going on and i do know i can tell when a guy knows what he's talking about you know uh, sometimes they're good and sometimes they're not good but um you know, once you begin to understand, like I, on the, on the places that we fish a lot, we never take guides because we we know all those rivers and uh, and we know how to roll a boat, so we know how to get to where we want to go. Um, anyway, the last section we better finish this up is streamers and poppers, um, and basically, uh, Clark, we were going to we were going to, I guess, um, share this particular one. Um, okay. <laughs> and I think you had some. Um, uh, let's see, I'm just trying to think. Well, in, in the outline, we're just talking about streamers and poppers. Basically, you have uh, two types of, uh, of uh, bait that they're trying to imitate. One is a fish, you know, a bait fish, which would be a small, uh, uh, you know, fish that uh, other fish are eating. Um, and then the other, uh, which is uh, leeches and sculpin and things like that. Um, those are, those are basically, uh, uh, you know, I think a lot of the ones that, uh, Linda, you've been using, uh, in, uh, in the ponds, um, Linda, what, yes. Linda, what have you, what have you been using in the ponds? Uh, sculpins? Uh, everything. Um, really everything I've, I've caught fish with and, and John too, fish with dry flies, woolly buggers, worms, leeches. Uh, right now I'm tying up these guys, which are called a magic bluegill bug or something. And it's just a, it's just a really, you know, buggy looking, uh, kind of woolly bugger kind of thing. And that works really well. I'm going to try these guys, which are, um, just some big bushy. Oh yeah. Um, uh, but, but just everything I have, uh, you know, I've caught them on caddis and uh, elk hair caddis and uh, BWOs, uh, just, it just depends on the time of year. John? Mm -hmm. well, I, I tend to use, I used to, <laughs> so, such a favorite is my beadhead woolly boogers. I use them all in Colorado and I use them down here and they're very yeah. effective. And I'll sometimes yeah. drop a, about a two foot dropper off of that and use a beadhead nymph. And the bluegills tend to take the nymphs generally and the uh, ba bass, they would. They generally go after the uh, woolly booger. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. I think um, you know, the, as far as the gear is concerned, if they're shorter leaders, um, I think the weighting uh, basically uh, they're either beadhead or they're weighted or the hook itself is weighted with uh, some kind of wire uh, and uh, is wrapped essentially. Um, the other thing uh, that you see, and I, I hate them, but are sinking lines. <laughs> I, I find it really hard to hard to uh, cast and, 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 and fish with sinking lines. But uh, there, there's some people that use them very effectively, and it's uh, and there are different kinds of sinking lines. You know, there are lines that are sink tip lines, and there are lines that, that the whole lines are sinking, and uh, they are they are different uh, weighted lines. So I mean, uh, I think it's is it John? Is it the sink rate? Right? I mean, they have different kinds of sink rates. So some, some actually sink faster than others. And uh, anyway, I, I have a hard time with them, so I never use them, but, but there are a lot of people that, that use them. And in some places, uh, you know, uh, where they feel like you have to get the, the, the fly down very quickly and it's heavy water, uh, that's basically what you're gonna, what you're gonna be using. Um, so, so those are the ways that, you know, the, the flies are actually brought down. And uh, Clark, did you have something you wanted that you could show that uh, showed the uh, actual different types of flies there or? or you mean like uh, streamers? Streamers and. Um, oh. And the other. 
Um, if not, I, I can. Um, I, I, I've got a couple of things that I can show. So, so Rick, if you if you let me share the screen, I'll, I'll go ahead and show what I what I put together. And I sent you that picture of that comparison. Yeah. Dean, you're uh, you're set to go. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here is. Yeah. A streamer. And basically, it's kind of got, got a, a head here, which wait, this is all weighted. So this particular fly is going to get down into the water very quickly. And uh, this represents some type of bait fish. And so when you're fishing something like this, you're actually retrieving it pretty, pretty fast. You're bringing it in pretty quickly because it, it, it's supposed to look like a fish moving through the water. OK? And the other type of fly that I took a picture of uh, is a popper. And this is a fly that you cast and it's sitting on the, on, the, on the surface of the water and you're basically twitching it and popping it. So it looks like an injured bait fish to the, to the, uh, you know, to the fish. And so this can be very effective in some places. I, I think Linda, I think you've said that you, you have used these, haven't you? No, well, she's not there right now. I didn't, I didn't know that she went out. Um, I will tell you, I was in the Bahamas one time and um, we couldn't figure out why there were no bonefish in the flats where we were. And the guide said, oh, uh, that's why there are no fish. There's a big barracuda there. It was about three foot long, three and a half foot long barracuda. And he asked me if I wanted to try to catch him. And I said, okay. So I. I uh, switched to a steel leader and I put a, a popper on and I made the cast, twitched it one time and that, and that barracuda came screaming at, <laughs> screaming at the fly. Uh, my wife, Karen, who's about, you know, 4'11 and hundred pounds, she starts backing up as, as the fish are, come, are coming toward us. But uh, the barracuda took the fly and a hundred yards later, the barracuda was gone. So uh, <laughs> cut, cut right through the steel leader. Um, so anyway, um, those are the kinds of flies that, uh, you know, that you use, uh, with regard to streamers and poppers. Um, I find that when, um, you know, when you're, when you're using these kinds of flies, the fish can be very aggressive. Um, uh, and as I said, as far as the retrieval is concerned, uh, for bait fish type streamers, I think the, the, the retrieval is very fast. For other types of, um, of, fl of flies, you know, that are uh, uh, leeches and sculpins, things like that, I think the retrieval, retrieval is fairly slow. I mean, I'm not sure about that because I don't fish them very often, very often, very often but uh, John, are you familiar with that? I mean, is it a slower retrieve generally? I can't hear you, you're, you're muted right now, but. Yeah, they, I, most of the time I retrieve pretty quickly. You do, okay. Or, or I might re retrieve two quick ones and let it sink and then bring it from the bottom up. But most of my retrieving for trout is fast. Fast, okay. For, for here in the lakes, um, I think part of it depends on the season. You know, bass moves uh, much more slowly in the winter. Mm -hmm. And so you have to slow down your retrieve. Okay. Um, and I find generally I have to let it get down too. Uh, in it's the a difference here. I, same way, I, Linda, I, I let it go a lot deeper here and have more of a, have a retreat that comes more from the bottom straight up as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Whereas on the rivers, it's more of a, it's just a straight downstream. Yeah, yeah. Um, I know I, I, I have fished in the Potomac for smallmouth and, um, you know, that's, <laughs> you're, you, you're, you're retrieving pretty fast you know, when you're doing that. Uh, but, um, but anyway, uh, I think that that pretty much covers what we wanted to cover um, with regard to the types of flies and uh, how you fish them. Um, are there any questions about any of that or do you wanna? I've got another question for John. On, on the nymphing, uh, uh, do you use fluorocarbon much or? at all or? You know, I, I, I don't, uh, I, I would only use fluorocarbon when I get into spring creeks and really technical water. Uh, and I might try that on something like San Juan, but for the most part, I don't really want to fish those places too often. My preference is to fish fairly aggressive, fast water, a lot of pocket water, a lot of deep, heavy runs. 
-hmm. which don't require that generally. And I also don't like to fish where it's been fished a lot. I do end up in the San Juan or the roaring fork, the frying pan that gets a lot of pressure. And when you do that, then you do have to get pretty tactical. Those fish are educated and uh, then you have to go to fluorocarbon. Mm -hmm. but it's not, it's really not my favorite. It's expensive. It kinks up pretty bad. Guides don't use it very much. And uh, most of the rivers I fish, I don't need it. I know a lot of guys don't use it at all because they feel like it takes forever for it to do, for it to, um, um, Disintegrate. Take down, yeah. Uh, so they, you know, much much longer than fluorocarbon, and uh, I mean, uh, than uh, monofilament. Um, I will tell you that in um, in saltwater, they they use fluorocarbon a lot, um, but I think it's I think it breaks down a lot faster in saltwater. So I think that covers it all, Linda. So you got a few things you wanna? Oh, do you have a question? I have a question for all of you experts being a novice at this. If you go to some place to fish for trout and stuff, do you recommend that you get a guide and go on the float trip and do all of that stuff? To if help it's the you first time, yeah. Time? Absolutely. I, I, I'll, I wish in my earlier days of learning to fly fish, I had done much more of that. Um, I was younger, didn't have as much money, that kind of stuff. So you try to do it on your own. You go out and maybe catch a fish or two. I, I, anytime I go, I will generally, anytime I go, I'll hire a guide. Even if it's the water that I've fished a number of times before, um, I'll hire a guide and it's worth the money, I think, especially when you're beginning. It's really helpful. If you get a, you got to have a good guide. And yeah, that's the, of course, that's that's really the thing. You know, sometimes you go to a place and the, you know the guides aren't very good. I mean, basically, um, you know, we know enough people that uh, if I'm going to some place I have not been to, and I know people have fished there, I I would check with them and find out. Exactly. Some of the best. I, I would do that with now knowing John where he fishes and and um, Dean where he fishes. And if somebody knows uh, Oregon, I've never fished Oregon. I would pick one of you guys who's fished Oregon and get a good outfitter, know the river and water to fish the time of year and go from there. I agree, Dean, that's very important. And and if you wanna go fish up in the White Mountains, there is a uh, one full-time guide up there. Her name is Cinda Howard. Uh, Arizona Fly Fishing and Beyond, I think is her Facebook page or website. So she's she's very good. Yep. I would add one thing would to you, Would you give me that name again, please, Linda, or send it to me or something? Uh, yeah, I'll send it out. It's Cinda, as in Linda, but with a C, Howard. But I'll send that out. Thank you very much. Hey, John. Yeah, John. Let, me add, let me add one thing about hiring a guide. It, the, the big decision with hiring a guide is whether you're going to wade fish or you're going to float fish. And there's if, if you're there to learn how to fly fish and really learn the way the river works and about insect life and everything else, you're going to learn a lot more on a wade fishing experience. Right. But you know, have to know what your legs can handle. And you may not catch as many fish. When you float and they put you on top of the big fish after fish after fish, it's an incredible experience. It's rough on your legs if you're going to be standing up most of the day, but it's not as tough as wading through heavy water. So you really need to decide if you're there for an educational experience or you're there to catch a bunch of fish. And you'll learn in the boats, but you won't learn as much as you will when you're wade fishing. I think if you're gonna go anywhere- Can I make a comment? Yeah. Go for it, Eric. Yeah, uh, Mr. Ashwood, I had, I've owned a couple of fly shops in the past. And as we've been speaking here, people have been speaking for the last hour and a half. What I've been doing is going through my boxes and boxes and boxes of flies, putting together a little packet for everybody. But having owned a fly shop, I can say that at least my experiences were always give the people what they think you, you think that they're going to be most successful with. And people are coming in and telling you what they've used. When I was in Oregon, I fished the Rogue River almost every day for four or five years. And so I had guides who came, you know, work out of my shop but only after I went out with them to see how they would treat customers and their knowledge. And I, even today, if I go fly fishing, wherever it is, I'm going to find out what I think is the best fly shop in that area, number one. And number two, I'm going to go out with a guide for a day. I might be there for a week, 
but I'm going to go with the guy because they know the water, they know what's working, where to go and how to fish it. And it's the difference between having a good time and not so good a time, number one. Number two, somebody mentioned a stimulator earlier. On the Rogue River, there was a time of the year we used to catch what they were called, there were half pounders, we call them. They were like two to five pounds steelhead. And the stimulator, I probably caught as many fish on the stimulator than I did uh, trout. It's just uh, every water is different. And so finding somebody who has the local knowledge will make your trip that much more enjoyable. I've enjoyed the session. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, John. Thank, and any thank questions? You, Eric. By Rattler? the way, my name is Dick, not Mr. Ashwood. That was my father. Um, <laughs> well, I didn't have And I, I used to fish the Rogue me. River, but it's been 30 years ago since I fly fished there. And it, it yeah. was a lot of fun. It was a beautiful place. The, if, if you get the chance to go back, when I was there, it was in the 1980s. And there's a section right below Lost Creek Dam. It was 0.6 miles long. Been I don't there. know if you fished there or not, but yes, we sir. call it the holy water. And a fellow who used to fish out of my fly shop and guide, uh, Brian McCullough, we named it after him. The holy water was he used to fish there all the time. I went with him on a boat trip one time, along with my wife and my son, and we caught over 106 trout just on a half afternoon. And it was wow. just for my son, who was seven years old at the time, uh, unbelievable experience. Yeah, so it's all good the more you can taste the more you like it thank you so, so i should thank end you. by by saying that we've got two gifts for the graduates of our our academy the participants or members and, and one is a um it's a beginning fly fishing guide and it's put out by orbis this is this is it i don't know if you can you see that okay yep. um it covers all the things that we talked about in the last four sessions, uh, from gear to you know flies, casting, um, technique, all of that. Um, and then I think Eric said that he was going to put together the package of flies for the the uh, participants. And um, and Linda, uh, I believe we are going to uh, do a casting class at some point and try to give those out to the to the participants at that at that particular event or get the get a, get the uh, gifts to them uh, separately so I'm gonna let you take that over yeah um, well we'll we'll announce soon about when that casting class is um, it'll be what probably within the next uh, two three weeks and Dean, I wanted to say about your book, I'm almost done reading it, and I wish you'd given it to me a year ago. Could have saved me a lot of frustration <laughs> um, because I've learned most of those things through trial and error now. So well, the whole point of, yeah, the whole point of this is to try to make it a little faster, you know? Yeah, good book. <laughs> I think he did that on purpose. <laughs> yeah. This was awesome. Thank you, Dean, for another successful program. And uh, to our guest presenters, uh, Clark and John, and don't worry about the technical stuff. We're not worried about that. We're all trying uh, to learn new things. So um, anybody have anything else? Um, real quick question. Uh, John, would you be a good contact uh, if I wanted to uh, go up to Colorado and fish Arkansas? Absolutely. Yeah, and I'll, I, the guides are all my friends. So I can really, you won't have to worry about them telling you the wrong thing up there. <laughs> <laughs> is it is some of it uh, is some of that water big enough for a boat drift boat? Yes, it is. They they have, they run a real good. They they have to be licensed white water rafting guides in order to go on the Arkansas, so they can do both at the same time. And um, where would you fish out of? What what town? Salida. Salida. Okay. Salida. Yep. Arc Arc anglers out of Salida, and I'll Thank join you. All right. Great. Thank you. you Linda, did you have, did you have uh, any more? I'm sorry, Dean. Did you have anything else? No, just it's just in time for happy hour. Okay. Yeah. Five o'clock somewhere. Yeah. Good show, everyone. It's terrific. John and Clark, thank you very much. Recording, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I know. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hey, Dick, are you still there? <laughs>